We appreciate all the work our choir does. While they're finding seats, I want you to do something a little different. I want you to stand up and I want you to turn to your neighbor. We're talking about agape love today. It's very aggressive and it doesn't have to be loved back to get it. I want you to stand up, turn to your neighbor and say, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Will you do that, please? <laughs> I love you. Well, good. I wouldn't want you to. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it either. <laughs> I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I love you guys. You take care. You know, I was busy, sh busy shuffling my bulletin around. I forgot to mention, George and Donna are headed back to Washington this week. So I've done everything I could to talk them into staying. If you have any secrets, please, please do that. But no, we know you need to head back. But we're glad you came down, that we could just share some love and support with you. And you come back soon. Don't forget us. We'll be coming after you otherwise. So <laughs> but we do appreciate George and Donna very much. Came upon a very interesting little story. There was a man who was just getting into genealogy and just loved it, just went all overboard. Anyone into genealogy, studied your, your family history? We got a few here. And um, he came upon some notoriety in their family. All the way up in Montana, they had a great, great uncle named Remus Starr, who was very noted, very popular, and everybody up in Montana back in his time in the 1800s knew about Remus. Well, this good genealogist shared it with his family that they've got a star in their family line. And so they got a family reunion coming up in the fall, and he said, I'm going to go up to Montana and just take a little tour, and I'm going to see what I can find about our great, great Uncle Remus Star, and I'll be bringing you back the report. So everybody was all excited. Their family line has got a celebrity in it. Well, this man made his way up to Montana, found the county library, Started looking through all the old, old files. They put all these ancient new newspapers onto microfiche. And finally, he found it back in 19, 1889. There it is. The big story, the big headline was his uncle, great, great uncle, excuse me, Remus Starr. And they had a picture. And the picture had a big platform in the city square there of this, of this uh, Montana town. And he looked and his great, great uncle is there on the platform and everybody surrounding, looking, and he zeroed in to try to see what his great, great uncle Remus looked like and noticed on the platform, there's this big wooden board that goes across the top and right underneath it, there was a rope. And he got looking a little closer at the story on this and here's what he found. Remus Starr, horse thief sent to Montana Territorial Prison, 1885. He escaped, 1887, robbed the Montana Flyer Railroad six times. He was caught by the Pinkerton detectives, convicted and hanged, 1889. Well, he was so disappointed. They thought they had a star in their family, and look what he found. Then he had another gulp. Oh, I promised the family I was bringing them back a report on our great-great-uncle Remus Starr. Well, he went to the family reunion, and he kind of um, reshaped the story just a little bit. Some people think he kind of spun the story a different way. Well, I've got the story. See what you think. Here's what he told his family about their great-great-uncle Remus Starr. Remus Starr was a famous cowboy in the Montana Territory. His business empire grew to include acquisition of valuable horses and intimate dealings with the Montana Railroad. Beginning in 1885, he devoted several years of his life to service at a government facility, finally taking leave to resume his dealings with the railroad. In 1887, he was a key player in a vital investigation 
run by the renowned Pinkerton Detective Agency. This guy's good. In 1889, Remus passed away during an important civic function held in his honor when the platform on which he was standing collapsed. <laughs> Don't you want this guy doing your eulogy? I'll, I'll see if I can find him for you. But there's always a way we can spin things, isn't there, to make it sound better than it really was and kind of gloss over all those mistakes. Well, I wonder back, we don't have historical records of this, but I wonder when John the Apostle finally got it into his heart and his head and whatever it took to write the gospel that has his name upon it, how he undertook that adventure and thinking about it and what he said to Peter said, Peter, because they were good friends and spent time together, and said, Peter, I've got to write a gospel, but you know, you've got some pretty low points in it all. And I'd like to think that Peter would have said, John, you've got to tell the story. You've got to tell the honest story with no spin. Just tell it like it is. And we find Peter falling into terrible ways and such embarrassment, but I also find him finding his way back up again. When we look into the story, it's after the resurrection, and Jesus has met up with his disciples there in the Sea of Galilee. And we jump into the story in John chapter 21, and picking it up at verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. And may God add power to the reading of this word that it becomes alive to us today that we can find ourselves in this story as well. It's after the resurrection. And Jesus has instructed his disciples before his passion, before his death, that after this is all done, we'll meet up again in Galilee and there we'll regroup. There we'll get a fresh start upon things. And sure enough, the disciples find their way there and they're out fishing. That's their livelihood. And while they're out fishing, Jesus comes to them on the shoreline and yells out to them, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. You'll find fish there. And they do that, and they haul in a great catch. They can barely bring it all into the boat. And it's John that realizes it. He says, that's the Lord. That's the Lord on the shore. And Peter's so excited about that, he had to dive right into the water to hurry over to meet Jesus again. And when he meets up with Jesus, Jesus is there by a campfire, frying up some fish, getting breakfast ready for them. I can see myself trying to picture myself as Peter coming out of the water. You're all wet and you come up to meet Jesus and he's there by a campfire. Do you remember the last time Peter was at a campfire? He was there in the, the courtyard of Annas' house and it was there that he denied Jesus three times around a campfire. And upon the third denial, Jesus was able to see him and gazed at him. And Peter felt all of his failure right there. Peter comes into the same situation where Jesus is there at the campfire and they meet up again. But it's not all good for Peter. He loves Jesus. He cares so much for him. He's, he's so excited to see him again. And yet there's all these failings. It was just so many days ago that Peter had deserted Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was arrested. It was there in the courtyard of Annas that Peter denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And even called curses down upon himself if it was not true. He had denied Jesus in such a miserable way. And here was Jesus again. Now what do we do? What's going to happen now? What is Jesus going to say? 
He knows what Peter has done. He knows what a terrible thing he has, he has done to let his master and his friend down. How will Jesus feel about him? Human nature. We make plenty of mistakes, don't we? How many people do not make any mistakes? Okay, I want to check. I was going to come up with a sermon about honesty next Sunday. If that was the case. We all make mistakes. I know I myself, I've made three this year alone. I can barely imagine these, how these things work out. But how do we handle how we handle our mistakes is what makes all the difference. It's not simply that we make mistakes. Well, Sigmund Freud, and I like to read his writings, even though he really gets out there sometimes. But I was so shocked and hurt when I read some of the last things he wrote. At 83 years old, he's bitter. He's disillusioned. He has lost all of his disciples. Everyone has turned away from him and given up on him. And he himself has rejected some of his own disciples. This is the man who is supposedly the grandfather of psychoanalysis, supposedly has the great insight on human nature. Well, here's some of the last words he has to say about people. This is Sigmund Freud writing, I have found little that is good about human beings on the whole. Doesn't that get you here? Just warm, fuzzy feeling. In my experience, most of them are trash. No matter whether they publicly subscribe to this or that ethical doctrine or none at all. Kind of gives you goosebumps, doesn't it? Sigmund Freud looks upon human nature and says they're all trash. They desert you. They let you down. There's nothing good in them. That was his assessment. Jesus has a different kind of assessment. In the Old Testament, Scripture itself begins to take on a new perspective about mistakes that that's not the end of the line. In some cultures, dishonor is worse than death itself. If you make a big mistake, it's time to bring out the Harry Carey knives and end your life at that point. But in the book of Proverbs, we find the wisdom. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. Those aren't just casual mistakes. Those are falling down on your face kind of mistakes. But the righteous ones know how to get back up again. That's the secret of it all. Do we learn from our mistakes? When I was a restaurant manager at Perkins, we had waitresses and cooks made plenty of mistakes, and it was always my job to take them aside after the lunch rush and say, you know what happened? We really messed up. The line got out of order because you got that one order wrong, and they couldn't get it caught up again. Well, now here is the deciding moment with this employee. How are they going to respond to that? Some will respond with, you know it, wasn't my fault. It was their fault. It was the machine's fault. It was the cook's fault. It was somebody else's fault. I did what I was supposed to do and somebody else messed up and on and on and on. And the wisdom of good old Shakespeare is in the back of my mind saying, me thinkest he protested too much. <laughs> and I know that it's gone into belligerence and this employee probably doesn't have much longer to go with us. But what always impressed me and other restaurant managers too was the employee that said, you're right, I got that order out of line, I know what I did, and I know how to correct it, and that's not going to happen again. I see how it can go wrong, and I see how to get it fixed, and I've got to, I'm on top of it. I understand it now. And I look at an employee like that, and I say, you know, you're a better worker now than you were yesterday. You're a smarter worker now than you were yesterday. And you're more valuable to us now because you are learning from your mistakes. That's the trick. Learn from what you did wrong and become a better person for it. When I did my chaplaincy work at Lexington, Kentucky, I remember that so well. We met in the morning, we had lunch, we took a tour, and then the supervisor said, see you guys at four o'clock, here's your floor assignments. Came back at 4 o'clock and told our stories of miserably failing and stumbling over things. And the instructor, the supervisor, was quick to point out, are you going to be smarter tomorrow? Have you learned from this day? And we continue to learn. When you seek advice, who do you seek advice from? Isn't it an elder sage? Somebody that's been through it? Somebody that's found a way to survive through all of these hardships? Isn't that the person you want to listen to? Or do you turn to Lindsay Lohan? You, you, you take your pick. Who, who do you think is going to be able to give you real wisdom in this? 
I, I get concerned sometimes. I'm at the grocery store waiting in line and look up to see the magazines and I'll see some magazines will have advice from Paris Hilton. <laughs> Can I just say, if you find yourself reaching for a magazine that says advice from Paris Hilton, can I just say spiritually you're in a very bad place? <laughs> call, please call, let's, let's get together and let's talk about this. You know, people that learn from their mistakes, they're the smart ones. We want to talk to them. We want to spend time with them because they're good. They're stronger. They're smarter now from all their experience. And perhaps that's what Peter, Jesus saw in Peter. He said, Peter, you've made a lot of mistakes. But I believe if you can get over these things, if you can find your way back, I really need you in the disciples' party here. I really need you to help get the church foundation established. Peter, you're my man. I need you. And Jesus comes to Peter and confronts him three times about this question of love. Well, I've been in Bible studies with this one. I always enjoy it when someone speaks up and says, why can't Jesus leave him alone? Peter's already been through enough bad times. He already knows that he's a failure. and He already feels the embarrassment and foolishness of all this. Why does Jesus have to keep rubbing his face in it? Why does Jesus have to keep making it so hard for Peter? And I always respond, that's because Jesus will not tolerate superficial relationships. He wants relationships that are real, that are honest. And he's willing to take a chance a little bit here, willing to go through a little bit of pain so we can work these things out, so that we can get our relationship back on stable ground once again. It's good advice for us with our friends and our marriage and church and any social group we're in. When somebody does something awkward and it hurts you, the wise thing to do is speak up. Now granted, sometimes those little pains really aren't worth it. Just let it go and just move on. But sometimes when those things hit us hard in our heart and cause us to stumble and the next morning we wake up and we still got it. If you really love this person who's caused you this harm, you will take the time to get with them and say, hey, can we get together for lunch? It's on me. I want to talk to you about something. And talk about that event. Talk about what happened. In conflict mediation, with churches running into trouble, and I've been there in these, these matters. And when you get them at a table, and you start it out by saying, okay, you, you start, tell us how all this happened. What, what happened? And they'll just simply say, you know, I was hurt. When I thought, John, I thought he was my friend, and he said this. And then I turn to John, and John says, I didn't know that hurt you. I didn't mean that. That's not what I was talking about at all. I meant something else. And sometimes those, those big conflicts get resolved because we took care of it in the beginning. We didn't let those things just pass by. Because when they pass by, they stay, and they grow. And they become malignant to your relationship. Jesus was going to let that happen with Peter. He wasn't going to let Peter live the rest of his life wondering about it. I made such terrible mistakes. How do I rectify them? How do I get back on board with these things? That's why Jesus is doing this to Peter. He confronts him to get all this out in the open. He's a master psychologist in this regard. But he loves Peter that much to get him back on board. And he starts it all out. He says, Peter, they're at this campfire. And Peter... Jesus says, do you love me more than these? Do you still love me? Well, how about it? And then Peter responds, you know that I love you. You know, I can see Peter's, Andrew, Peter's brother Andrew back behind him seeing this. And Jesus confronting Peter with such a great statement, do you love me? Oh, I imagine Andrew's thinking, oh boy, Peter's going to get his. Jesus is going to ream him out one into the other after all that Peter has done to him. But Jesus takes a very loving approach to it. Do you love me? Now it's interesting the words that they use here because they're shifting their words for love around between Jesus and Peter. And we miss that sometimes in our English languages. But if you'll permit me to share this, you've heard the word agape before. That's the strong love, very aggressive love. I will love you and if you don't like it, too bad. I'm going to love you anyway. It's a very strong love. It doesn't have to have anything coming back at you again. When I was in grade school, and I hope I wasn't the only one here, 
when you fell in love with that magic girl that's going to change your life all the way back in third grade, you write a note saying, I like you. Do you like me? And then you put a real fancy little yes with a box, no with a box. Please check one. And I got up my nerve and I hand her the note and then run off. I did it. And I always forgot to say, give this back to me so I know. <laughs> so I never found out. I may have missed some opportunities back there in third grade. I, I don't know what may have happened. But agape doesn't ask the question, do you love me back or not? I just love you and that's just the way it is. And that's the way Jesus approaches it to Peter. Peter, do you love me? Despite all things, do you love me? And the way that Peter responds to him is so interesting because Peter doesn't use the word agape. He uses another word. The word he uses is philos. Now, we have this word that comes up in our own English language, especially here in America. Philadelphia, the, brother of, or the city of brotherly love. That, that's named after this word here. Philos is sometimes translated as like, liking somebody. It's not as aggressive as the agape love. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know that I like you. It's not quite the same level. Do you see the difference here in their transaction? Peter's not yet stepped up to this higher level. And then Jesus responds to him, well, if you like me, then you feed my lambs. Jesus is saying, essentially, talk is cheap. Let's see you prove it. Let's see you prove it in the way you take care of other Christians, the way you take care of other people of God, the way that you're with them and helping them. Are you tripping them up? Are you stabbing them in the back? Are you making it hard for them? If you really love me, you will take care of God's people. And that's that. Well, they're at the campfire, and I can just see it's quiet again. And then Jesus all of a sudden brings it back up again. Peter, do you love me? That love, agape love, comes back up again. And Peter, what he must have been feeling, we got to do this again? And Peter responds to him the same way. Jesus, you know that I like you. He's back to that philos, philos concept again. He's not able to rise up to the stronger, more aggressive agape love. And Jesus says, if you like me, then take care of my sheep. Take care of my people. Jesus is saying, I need you, Peter, to be part of the band of disciples here. In just a matter of weeks, they're going to be assembling together. The Holy Spirit will descend on Pentecost. The church is going to be founded. And you're the keynote speaker, Peter. I want you to get ready for this event. I need you. Take care of my sheep. Well, they're at the campfire again. Maybe it's quiet. And then Jesus has to do it a third time. Keeps bringing it up a third time. And this time he says a shocking question. Peter, do you like me? Now Jesus has descended to the word philos, into that lower level of, of love itself. Peter, are we still friends? And Peter responds to him, Lord, you know all things. You know how this is killing me. You know what this is doing to me. And you know that I like you. You know that we are friends. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Take care of others. Take care of them. Why does Jesus do this to him three times? Is it not because that was the number of times that Peter had denied Jesus? Each one of these times, Jesus is taking Peter through it, but each time, he's giving him an opportunity to reverse all those wrongs. You've denied me once, will you confess me once? You've denied me twice, will you confess me twice? You've denied me three times, will you confess me three times? Peter, we're repairing all of this. We're setting back in order what went wrong just, just a few weeks ago. We're getting this back on a right foundation, back on a right footing. Jesus is saving Peter. Jesus is bringing Peter back up on his feet again, bringing him back up after his falling. In the book of Romans, Paul explains this so well. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. 
Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to, to get back, to overcome all of his failings. Some of us may feel from time to time, I've doing, done too many bad things. I don't see how God will ever want to forgive me. But the forgiveness is always there. The opportunity to enter into a deeper, more meaning relationship with Jesus is always present for you. It's always available.